workshop yesterday. Did you work or did you shop? <laughs> we did both. Funny <laughs> word, workshop. Isn't it? Good morning. Uh, my name is Taylor Power, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> let me tell me let me tell you something about myself. Why I was so presumptuous to think that I have to share something with you about teaching artificial intelligence and replacing teachers with computers. Um, I'm an engineer. I'm passionate about engineering. I like doing things. I like solving problems. I like making things that will make people's life easier, better, healthier, happier. Um, and I still do, I still think of things. But uh, 30 years, almost 30 years ago, I fell in love with teaching. I didn't plan this, it just happened. And uh, I simply love the aha effect. Actually, my passion is learning something, then finding a way to make it more simple to other people. Now, uh, but besides teaching uh, this engineering boring concept, the students who actually believe it should be done in a much quicker way by sleeping on their smartphone and integrating the knowledge. I also teach uh, professional skills, something we used to call soft skills, to people in the industry, in government, everywhere else, how to communicate, how to solve conflicts, and other things. So these are two types of teachings. And in addition to that, I also teach dance. I teach classical ballet to recreation of people. So I'm trying to learn from all sorts of teaching what actually goes in teaching, what doesn't, what is specific for our various uh, places. But the third thing about me, I'm also an innovator. I do have some patents in computer security and communications, but actually I've done a lot of innovations in, in my teaching. And uh, I started recording all my lectures in 1997, and everything is available online for me. Uh, my students now make their exams from home without supervision and they did it seven years ago first time so it has nothing to do with COVID and I develop a, a number of tools to be used in teaching and I try and test them for my students and myself. Well, it's been 30 years but I don't see much changes in teaching and education because of this wonderful technology we have. Now, let me see briefly who are you. So, what is your experience? What do you do now? What did you do before? Who is teacher? Who teaches? Okay. Who is managing institutions or did so? Well, so help you God. <laughs> <laughs> Who makes policies? Very modestly, yeah. Is there anybody who is supporting those who teach and learn? Huh? Just a few? Okay, so I know how to proceed. proceed. Now, I'm supposed to speak about artificial intelligence and teaching. Let, let's make things clear. We don't have artificial intelligence. When we say intelligence, we think about people. Even my dog has intelligence and humor. It is lying. What we have today are various types of autobots. There are very specific tasks. They don't have reasoning like humans. They don't have values. They don't have emotions. And it's a huge question. Why people have been built with emotions? Why do we need them? I have a couple of theories. We can talk about it during the break or, or dinner last day this night. But our automats don't have this. Yes, we are trying to build more generalized automats, those that will be able to combine several knowledges, but something like uh, the most stupid person you know, we don't have in a machine. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> but these automats, as simple as they are, they can do things efficiently, predictably, scalable, in a limited way, but they can be very, very useful. But let's step back. The world that we used to build our education, the world that was there when we 
current educational system that we still employ, this is the world. And we live in this world. And I claim that we change nothing in our education. Our policy to day to day execution. And maybe result. Schools used to be the place where the knowledge is kept. Here is the knowledge. Books, professors, our brains. We have the knowledge. You have to come here, you have to sit here, 8 o'clock in the morning, on the Monday morning, and then you will get the wisdom from me. Nowhere else. When I started teaching 30 years ago about microprocessors, I was in a poor country. My students didn't have textbooks. There were a few. And for what I was teaching none. When I started teaching internet 25 years ago, there were no books in Croatia. And there was no Google. Even there were no web pages at that time. Worldwide web didn't exist. Today, knowledge is everywhere. In the field, in the mountains, on the seaside, uh, in factories. Uh, nature, wherever you want, on any continent, everywhere, knowledge is everywhere. School used to be a place to learn. If you want to learn, you go to school. But as you can see, the same classroom, same school in Croatia, nothing has changed for 30 years, even more. They still teach the same one. And the learning has to be in the field while you are plowing the field or planting seeds. When you're researching a mountain, the climate, when you are trying to figure out new choreography for your dance, or you are just having vacations, you have to work, of course, and learn. Everywhere where a smartphone is, is learning. You know all this that I'm going to tell you, but let me remind you. In the past 10, 20, 30 years, we've seen something unbelievable. We have got technologies, applications, that no one could give, that could exist, that could be available to every individual, basically for free, but the cost of a smartphone. We have a worldwide web. <coughs> all the knowledge and the internet, all the people to communicate with. We have robots, we have internet of things, and we have artificial intelligence. We have a computer in our pocket, we have web camera, we have camera in our pocket, uh, audio recording device in our pocket, cinema in our pocket. And we have these wonderful things like Wikipedia. Did you dream 30 years ago that you will be able to sit anywhere and have the wealth of the biggest possible encyclopedia? Or watch videos about anything? Did you dream about it? And now you have chat GPT, you can chat with it, hopefully, in a smart way. And of course, a plethora of social media and other communication devices to talk to people you never will meet. You don't know if they are humans or dogs or artificial intelligence and exchange information. Look at this. Those who teach, those who are learners, tell me, how many words do you need? to explain any of these concepts visualized here. How many drawings you have to draw on a blackboard? How many photographs or pictures you need to explain what is explained here in just a few seconds of a visualization? How many words? And to what end? What will be the result? How quality, how, how, what is the quality of explanation that we can achieve without such a video? Let me show you something uh, fascinating for me. Look at this.
want to be happy? Who wants to be happy? Do you know what happiness is? Let me show you. Do you know what is endorphin? It's a hormone of happiness. Well, this ball, big ball, is endorphin. And this little fellow walking is a protein that's dragging the endorphin to the place in my brain to make it happy. Imagine what this video could do for philosophy class, ethics, literature, art. Now, uh, why don't we fall from our bikes? Who knows the answer? Because of force of recession. And we all explain this, some show this in class with a... Yes, with us. Um, I'll just get this gyroscope here. We have a bicycle. And it's just a, a gyroscope really, but of course in zero gravity, if you knock it, it's going to tumble, it's going in to move station. around. Um, it just like any object up here does. But However, if I get this uh, spinning, just give me a second. If it spins, it becomes stable. And that's why we don't fall from the bike. That's why ships spin. So once the gyroscope is spin spinning, you can just see how stable it becomes. And however I knock it, it's not going to change its plane. It's going to remain in the same plane. I can put it physically into a different... For some of us, it will be a little bit expensive to go and make it for our kids. Now, another thing that we have, a wonderful thing that we have, is...
if our students can do that before our lecture, before encountering teacher in classroom in the laboratory, what am I supposed to do? 30 years ago, I had the information. And I had scarce equipment in my lab. They have it now. They don't need me. What can I do better? That's the question. Reality check. How does your teaching or learning look like? Let me show you an example from a prestige European university from a country no longer in the EU. This is obsolete. 
I should try to be the best teacher to some people. The best teacher to some people worldwide and forever. There's no point in trying to be good to everyone because there is always someone better in something than me. And it's available. She or he is available. I should try to be the best in something. I don't know what it is. Trying to figure out. To something. And make myself available to everyone in the world. For real. If possible. That's my first message. Another message is the teacher is a fuzzy word. What a teacher, educator, educator is even fuzzier. What does it mean? <laughs> well, you can be a lecturer, a speaker. More than speaking, he likes listening to himself. You can be the content creator. You can write textbooks, examples, uh, lab experiments. You can be director. You can tell your students what to use, where to go, how to navigate the knowledge space. You can be a consultant. You can be a supporter of any car. The good news is you can be on one of the roles. You can be any combination of the roles. And my dear folks, you can change your mind and your interests. You can switch between roles, you can leave some and take new ones, you don't have to be the same thing for all your life. Hey, life is beautiful, be everything you can. Be everything you can. But you have to be careful, you have to carefully define your target audience. Who are you talking to? Who are you going to be the best, the best teacher or the best something? And what is the purpose? What do you want to achieve? What do they want to achieve? by using you. Please use me, and then you will be able to work. Okay, but I promise to talk about artificial intelligence. And yes, as I told you, there are no intelligence on only automates for specific tasks, but it can do things uh, useful. And even limited, artificial intelligence will be usable. For instance, Try going to ChatGPT and tell, why don't you explain this or that to a 16-year-old, or 5-year-old, or 19-year-old, or to someone who knows this or doesn't know that. And they are very, it's, it's a good, great tool to combine all the human knowledge and, and explain it in that way. It can be used for discussion and to give some advice. Now, uh, be aware. Today, the technology that we have, actually, this one example that we have that's publicly available, is very limited in the knowledge. It has vast amount of information, but it's still very limited. And you are never sure whether the advice is true or not. Um, think about it. Do you use Google Translate? Would you dare to translate into a language you don't know and use this if something's off? Importance to you, like being late for playing or uh, spending money. If you don't know the other language, there's automated translation tools that are still not so good to be trusted fully. They are great aid if you know the language and they help you if you translate and typing slowly. <coughs> but if I don't know the language, I don't really care. The same thing is with AI. You have to <coughs> but they will be better every day. So the students will use, your students, my students, they will use artificial intelligence. If I don't do it better than the artificial intelligence, limited as it is, if it's better than me, they'll use it instead of me. So I have to find what I can do better. And I'm competing with AI in time and space. I have to be available everywhere and every time they need me. If I can't do better than AI, don't compete. Step aside. Do something else, something that artificial intelligence can't. I don't know what it is. It's your profession, it's your students, it's your life. Find it. Or you can harness AI. Please harness. Use it for your good. Imagine that you are so good at teaching, whatever you do in teaching, that every 
anybody wants to listen to you, use your materials, be in, in, in counter with you. Everybody has a question for you, demand, task, assignment. They need you all the time, 24 hours, 7. They need you everywhere. How can you do that? How can you service everyone all the time, everywhere? Can you use artificial intelligence to do that? Now, current ChatGPT has been fed with information produced by many people. What if I feed it with only my information? Is this chat GPT going to become digital me? So can I make a digital transcription of myself? Hmm? What comes? And this digital me then would be able to talk with you, discuss with you as if it was me. How? Export myself. My knowledge, my experience, my values, I put everything in. And then this guy, I can go for a vacation and he will be talking to my students. And then I get paid. He doesn't. And everybody can be the user of digital me, right? And not only now, but also my kids, my grandkids. And I'll be famous. Stupid and famous. Famous by my stupidity. My limited use, that in five years or 55 years or 555 years will become obsolete, but funny. And people will be talking to me because it's so hilarious. How can I do this? Well, I can capture all my lectures right now. I can do interviews, ask somebody to interview me, or I can interview others. I can discuss, I can write blogs, I can make textbooks, learning clips tell stories, everything I can and I do, I should digitize, I should put it in a digital form. So this AI system, machine learning, can use this pool of something and represent me. So, if I don't discover what I can do better than anybody else, and if I don't do it, then I can offer somebody something that nobody else can. I should export all data and information I have, all my knowledge, experience, stories, but also emotions, attitudes, and values. If you want to learn to play violin or paint, if you can afford, you will choose the teacher, the mentor, that somehow by his human properties attracts you. If you are a very precise person, you will not go to a messy person to teach. If you are very creative and uh, you know unrestrained, you will not go to a very structured teacher. Or maybe you will. But you will base your choice of teacher on their personality, on their values, emotions, ways of their interaction. Well, there's no reason not to do it for math, physics, whatever other study logical concept there is. So if we don't do this, if we don't discover what we do next, and if we don't export ourselves so that we are valuable with our human traits, if we don't do that, I as a teacher will become obsolete. No. Reach, reduce in any form, physical or digital. And students, my students will replace it with other humans who already do something on the net or with the artificial intelligence. I have to offer and fail. What do you think? Is this realistic? Does it make sense? Will you think about it? Will you try to do something about it? In the rest of your day today? Or in the rest of your life? In these 30 years, as I told you, that I'm trying to do things with, with technology and education, I have a feeling that we have eyes wide shut. That we are deeply in the box. 
The question is, is it possible to innovate existing education system? Is it possible to innovate? Uh, because our education system, everything we do about it, deliberation, methods, organization, results, assessment, verification, content, everything is wrong. It's not been constructed carefully from the best evidence we have of how people teach and learn with the main goal to do best teaching. No, it has been the result of saving money, simple organization, random choice, and sometimes because of our vanity, laziness, ignorance, or comfort. No, it's not a carefully designed system, our education system. No, it's just, I don't know this. It's an inadequate today. For this world, for that world, everything we do is wrong. You know, people don't need the same amount of time to learn something. Yet we force them to do it at the same time, amount of time. Age cohorts, we know that it doesn't work. Grading system. My famous question is, if the, I don't know, um, what, E, D, F, 2 is the lowest passable mark, are you going to the dentist who got lowest possible mark? Or are you going to let someone with this mark to take care of your dog? Not mention a sick mother. So what is the point of this grade? Or how much do you have to know, you know, for this lowest grade in order for me to use your service? And then we are we are grading something that we have taught. We are basically also grading ourselves. It does work so it doesn't. And so on and so on. So everything we, we do basically is outdated, it's no longer true. Education today has to be personalized. Student needs to have this learning has to fit like a glove. It has to be ubiquitous, it has to be practical, it has to be collaborative. Because everything this civilization is built because of collaboration. The ability of people to communicate and work together. There is no single person who can build this building. There's no single person who can build a mobile phone. It's only through collaboration. And learning should be collaborative. Our learning and teaching, teaching as well, has to be inspirational, attractive, exciting, beautiful, empowering, motivating, and supporting. And above all, it has to be fun. It has to be ultimate pleasure. Learning today has been brought the notion in all nations around the world, except the poorest ones in Africa. All other developed countries, learning is learning. I have to learn. How many times people use have? Have to to learn. How many times people use, oh, I love learning. I can't wait to learn. Well, the light bulb did not come from improvement of canvas. It required a continuing concept. So does education. We really need to think completely outside of the box. Think of yourself. If you need to learn statistics or some laws or something that you really don't like and it's very difficult for you to learn or some language or something, but you have to, why would you need a teacher? Why would you use Google, Internet, whatever you do? Why would you like to have a teacher? What do you want from this teacher? What do you need from a school? Who should pay for your teaching, learn? If you produce something, who this knowledge belongs to? If you want to use the knowledge, who this knowledge you would like to belong to? How can you be sure that you really know? Really, if, if your life would depend on this piece of knowledge, how can you check, be absolutely 101% sure that you really do understand and know, that you are competent, capable? What kind of certificate do you want for your knowledge? for your experience. As teachers, as educators, as people who provide education in any way, do not do things, do not use things because it's always been done that way. It is popular, you don't have to use video, you have to use video because it's popular. Chat GPT in our teaching because it's popular. You know, if you don't use Chat GPT in your teaching, then you are obsolete. It's not too. Don't do things because nobody does it the other way. Or because it's safe. I won't be blamed for anything. Do 
and use things that can help students learn better. What are these? Dance in class, or take them to the road trip, or don't teach them if it's better for them. Something that will motivate them. Because, you know, the biggest crime I as a teacher can do is to demotivate, to be so boring, so complicated, that my student gives up. This is the ultimate crime a teacher can do. To push the student in the opposite direction of learning. And also do things that make you motivated, because if you are happier and more motivated, so will be your students. At least some of them. Those who will be the best teacher. We really need to think outside of the box, but I really mean outside. Don't obey any rules. Maybe some laws, but not rules. Well, can you do it? Well, it's going to be expensive, it's complicated. It won't be equal. Not all students will get the same thing from me. And that's, that's a big problem. Quality. I have to give everyone the same thing. No! They have to achieve. One needs more time, one needs more materials, one needs more something else. And there is no guarantee that you will succeed. And the moment I change something, I have to change it again. Because that's how the world functions. And nobody knows how to do it right. That's true, it's probably innovative. But Ford said, whether you think you can do it or you can't do it, it will be your problem. What do we need to do we need most? What do you vote for? What's the most important in order to improve education? To change education? Is it money? Let me see the hands. This is the most important thing. If you have money, you have to solve. Okay? Is it equipment, technology, resources, space? Is it teachers? Eh, only two hands. Two and a half. Who gives more? Is it different leadership? Uh, policies? Yes. Yeah. Ah, policies. If they tell me I can, then I will do it. If they tell me how, then I'll do it. Cowards! You are cowards. Who's the agent of change? Who's going to change education? Students? Teachers? Industry? I will run and I will proudly raise. Management? Policy makers, who is going to change? I claim teachers only. Do you know why we don't do it? Why I don't do it? Why you don't do it? Why they don't do it? Well, it's because we don't dare. We don't have courage to get out of our comfort zone. To set foot on uncharted territory, nobody can tell you if it works or not. We don't dare to make mistakes. To be responsible. You know, because if I change, if I do everything the way it was done, it's okay. If I change it, I'm responsible. If something goes wrong, and it will go wrong. Somebody won't like it. I don't dare to be guilty. And I will be laughed at pretty good. That's why I don't do it. I will be misunderstood. I don't dare to go boldly where no one is coming. to do it the way it was it used to be done. I'm not guilty. Oh, what do I have to do? I just do it the same way. I'm happy. I need to get paid. I can't endanger my family, my career. That's true. That's your choice. The most important agent of change is me, you, the teacher. It is you where everything starts. Do something you never did without being expert. Don't wait to be expert to do something. Do it immediately. Nobody will can tell you if it works. If even if I just suppose, even if it scares you, regardless of the risk for you, because you live only once. And all people of age say, I regret only things I didn't do, not the things I did. Step out. Step out. Yes. So, the final message is be the best teacher you can to some. Some, but four. Make this 
available to everybody, put it on the net, and make sure it's available forever. Choose what you want to do in teaching profession, to any combination, change it, but be focused on it, and know why I'm doing it. And make a digital transcription of yourself. Become the AI. Thank you. and uh, were a lot of ideas uh, and a lot of material to think about. Uh, some questions, some questions or comments. Angel, possibly you. Yes. Um... Thank you, you speak to my heart. Thank you. Not just my head. That was my intention. Thank Absolutely. You. And, and I think when, when we look at teaching and the importance of our teaching, it's that relationship that we have with our learners and uh, all our students. And looking at what you are speaking about in terms of agents of change and the context that we're teaching, we, are, we have to be flexitarians and flexible all the time. But also understanding that the way in which we engage and the levels of engagement are so different with every single person that we engage with. So it's about reading people. And when I say to students, you're sitting in the class and I've learned how to read from a face. You know, all those expressions that people use, so essentially important that when we're going to say something, we scan the room, we get a sense, we, we, we engage, we get people to interact as well. I loved your presentation because um, the courage to be and the courage to be different, very important. Thank you. Just a short comment. I think if I would have to pinpoint the single, single most important mistake we make is trying to give the same thing to everybody. That's what you just said. Yeah. Every person we interact with has different needs and different needs in our interaction. But we are so scared not to be, you know, to be unjust. I gave her more than him or the other way around. Um, and that's wrong. And yes, I will be making mistakes. But at least I tried to, to accomplish something with someone instead of trying to be, you know, average. Uh, we need uh, one more question because we need two questions at least for two <laughs> to be balanced. F feel free to make another question. Thank you very much for inspirational talk. I also enjoyed. But uh, my question is about the first part of your talk when you showed uh, this um, uh, technological tools that we can use as as uh, teachers to make our lectures more interesting and uh, what concerned me is uh, these uh, new tools, they can give you excitement, right? And they can excite and motivate uh, students to learn. But I uh, also know that uh, this excitement fades out <laughs> quite quickly and when you use to the tool then it doesn't engage you. Well, it engages you but the excitement is not as big. So. <laughs> What to do yeah. as a teacher in, in that case? Well, this indicates what you just said. It indicates what teacher's role might be, one of the most important roles. Because kids can find all these snippets of funny and interesting things around, but they don't know what to do. They don't know how to use them to their benefit, how to use them to learn. And I'll, we should be some kind of a guy. Tell them, try this, try that. And they come, oh, look, I have found this and that. We need to look into this content and say, oh yeah, but uh, why don't you try this and this? Why don't you try to use it that way? What, would be, what, what if we need to give them problems? And the best way to teach is to give them Socratic method by asking questions. Just ask them questions and let them play with the tools. But there is a problem also, and I'm proud that, that learners accomplish something that I, I named uh, 40 years ago, 50 years ago, a dictionary problem. When I started corresponding in English, I was continuously in a dictionary. 
But then, looking for my word, I found so many interesting words that after half an hour I forgot what I was looking in the dictionary. So this happens with internet, you know, you go looking for something and you find so many fascinating things, you spend the whole afternoon uh, without going back to do what you want. This is, we are the ones who need to help them to be on the course of their learning. Okay, just one comment, because some stereotypical, quite often stereotypical thinking, Socratic method, this is traditional approach. We need modern approach. <laughs> I am usually rejecting, for example, like the reading papers. This is traditional and this is modern. Yeah, I do agree with it. Yeah, no, one note is I'm not advocating to use technology for any means. No, don't use anything. Stick with your kids and talk with your kids. Use technology only if it's useful, if it's for the Purpose. I'm showing sure technology because it's wonderful, but don't use it because it's modern, popular, blah 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 blah. Use it only when and where appropriate. Even if it's chunk. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you missed Monday. Yes. yes. This is from Monday. Monday. Okay. <laughs> and this for today. Thank you.